It says mute. There we go. Um, Clear as mud. Finally good. Certainly uh, thankful for the Bible studies. Uh, Brandon and Janelle and their recent uh, immersions. Uh, Shelly and Jackie. Um, back to work on Monday, so. All right. Praise God. Um, Mike's new job. I'm thankful for the uh, uh, successful travel back from the Oregon family camp. Thankful I could spend time out there. Jackie's doing better. Uh, Steve is home uh, recuperating. Uh, Barb is doing better. And uh, Jack and Carol has um, moved over to the uh, thank yous, uh, taking care um, of uh, parents there. Um, grateful and uh, uh, thankful for um, uh, gathering this evening, a uh, chance to, to uh, go to God in prayer, a uh, chance to gather together um, as the people of God. I see uh, Dennis is back with us, so that's a, that's a thank you. He's feeling better. I guess you're feeling better unless you're just here to spread it around. So. Uh, um, keep... Uh, Keep Steve Meyer's uh, family in your prayers. And um, Jeremy's uh, cancer treatments uh, started this week, right? Yes, he's doing fairly well with that. The uh, Kermans family, uh, the uh, Zuver boys. Keep uh, Eve in your prayers. Uh, Glory, uh, Christy Grant. Nancy, uh, I think um, she was kind of you know, quarantined there for a little bit, so I don't know if she can have visitors or not, but keep Nancy in your prayers. Um, you know, Clawson, uh, uh, Harvey, a uh, little boy, and uh, the situation there. Um, keep uh, Pat Ziegler in your prayers, uh, Shelly, and uh, that's Fred's mom, right? Okay. Uh, so... Uh, keep uh, keep Pat in your prayers. Uh, East and travel. Uh, good to see uh, Arthur here. Um, 
You're here for good now or for bad or for, for good? All right, praise God. And did I understand on the way in you're already gainfully employed? Oh, what a guy. What a guy, you know. So, all right, uh, praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Keep Marshall and his, um, you know, thinking about travel there, keep Marshall and his travel in your prayers out to Bible Bowl. Um, uh, so uh, be in prayer for them. Um, keep uh, Ricky um, in your prayers. Um, Mike Netter's grandpa um, and the um, um, uh, Crosscut uh, family. Um, what else? <clears throat> I walked off without my bulletin tonight. What else um, did we have additions from Sunday that I need to mention? Okay, do we have any? Dean, keep Dean in your prayers. Yeah, Dean uh, and his shoulder. Thank you. Yeah, Brenda was uh, not feeling well. Yeah, thankful that Steve's home. Um, text him, get a hold of him, let him know that you're uh, you're praying for him. That that really means a lot. So um, let him know. A lot of the schools are closing. Okay. Yeah. The the um, virus uh, crisis. Um, continue to keep Barry and Robin in your prayers. Um, pray for the uh, Virginia family camp. Um, Mary S. and uh, Iris. Keep Ruth in your prayers. Um, Francisco. Um, that's um, you know, Millie's husband. Um, Shelly Elster. Um, boy, it's, um, it's kind of tough. To get used to seeing you sitting there, Matt. You know, I, mean, I, I looked. I looked up a couple times. So, who is that? You know. Uh, update on Shelly there. Uh, yeah, she can take her off. She's doing quite a bit better. Good. All right. Praise God. Okay. Keep the uh, Rodriguez family in your prayers. Aaron Ebert, <coughs> Roe and Sheila, um, Abby and Jack Whitehouse, Linda Boink, continue to uh, pray for them. Okay, move Linda over to the thank yous. All right. Anything else we ought to be uh, praying about? Aaron Everett is specifically employment. Uh, he's decided to stay in the area. Um, okay. Um, keep, uh, keep Aaron in your prayers. Uh, he was the uh, he was the preacher there, um, and um, kind of got <clears throat> kind of got um, convicted about some um, um, new creation principles, and uh, was uh, subsequently relieved of his duties at that local church. But um, you know, prices and some of them working with him there. He's working with that group, but he's going to need to find some uh, secular employment. So. Um, keep him in your prayers and keep that situation in your prayers. Um, some things that don't look like uh, maybe that that was the best design. That's exactly the things that uh, God uses uh, to bring his will about. Anything else we'll be praying about? Now, I heard some snickers <clears throat> when I um, mentioned the virus. 
But I've got um, a solution here. Um, before we pray, um, I got. Um, um, turn to Psalm 91. I want you to kind of be thinking about Psalm 91. Um, and kind of think about that in regards to um, the um, insecurity that we uh, seem to find ourselves in. Um, but um, you know, if I was uh, if I was uh, Pentecostal, I would say, "Here's a word from the Lord." Uh, I'm not, but here's a word from the Lord. <laughs> I think it speaks directly to. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe where, at least as the counterculture, we should be kind of uh, uh, putting our, our hearts and minds. Psalm 91. <clears throat> he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of Jehovah... He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Because he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will take refuge. His truth is a shield and a buckler. You'll not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand will fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only behold with your eyes and see the reward of the wicked. Because you, O Jehovah, are my refuge. You have made the Most High your dwelling. There will be no evil before you, nor will any plague come near your tent. Because he will give his messengers charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, lest you smash your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, and you will trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. I will satisfy him with long life and show him my salvation. Lord God in heaven, we come as your people. Father, depending on your promises. Father, when the panic has overtaken those who do not know you, Father, you have lifted us up. Lord God, we don't know the future, but we know who knows the future. And Father, we know that we can trust you. And that's not to say that these diseases won't befall us. But Father, we can rest assured 
that if our commitment is to do your will, your will gets done. We don't need to worry. Father, help us to be prudent. Help us to plan as though everything depends on us. But to proceed, Father, with the assurance that everything depends on you. Father, I am grateful and thankful to be part of those you have set apart from the foundation of the world. And Lord, that we know that you are concerned for your people. Father, I'm grateful and thankful that Steve is back home, that this heart attack wasn't any more serious than it was. Really grateful and thankful, Father, for Brandon, Janelle, for their family. Father, for that addition to your kingdom. And certainly thankful, Father, for <clears throat> the addition to the local family here. I just uh, pray, Father, you would continue to be with them. Uh, thankful that Jackie is uh, getting better. And Father, as we think about Jackie and the impact that uh, Brenda has had on Jackie, I, I do pray that you would be with Brenda and, Father, that you would restore her to health. Thankful, Father, that uh, Dennis is feeling better. He's able to, uh, to be here that Linda is finally on the mend. Father, that I'm grateful and, and thankful and give you the, the praise and the honor and, and the glory that Matt's mom is, is doing so much better. I pray you continue to be with uh, Shelly and Father, watch over her. God, I pray that you would be with Eve. Uh, She's, uh, her immuno uh, uh, is compromised. I just pray that you would watch over her. Uh, Father, uh, keep her safe and help her to make uh, good decisions. I do pray that you would be with Dean. Uh, God, that you would be with the doctors as they, Father, look for a, a diagnosis to relieve some of the pain that he's having with his shoulder there and just pray that you would watch over him and pray that you would be with Denise as uh, Father, it's never easy when the person that we love, we see them suffer. Just pray that you would be with her and Father, as she you know, works and as Dean works and she tries to take care of him and uh, just pray that you would be with them and help us to be a uh, Father of family that uh, Lord God can uh, support in prayer and, and to support each other. And I do pray, Father, for those ongoing concerns. Really uh, ask that, Father, you would open uh, something up for Aaron uh, Everett there, that he be able to remain in the area, that he be able to, to work with that group. Thankful, Father, for the the quality of his uh, conviction, uh, Lord God, that he was offered a financially easier way out of this thing, and uh, Lord God, he uh, you know, wouldn't take that uh, based on principle, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for men, Father, who are uh, convicted, who have conviction, Father, who will trust you when it looks like uh, Maybe from the world's standpoint, that's not the wisest thing to do. But, Father, that we know that you, you have our backs. We don't have to worry. I pray that you'll be with us this evening as we, uh, Father, look at this incident in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 10. Father, that we would not just see it as a historical account. But, Father, that we might be able to glean the principles there and uh, apply them to uh, our own lives. And, Father, that we might be on guard, 
And we might, uh, Lord God, not only be on guard of being too uh, comfortable, uh, but Father, that we would give you the praise and the honor and the glory when things are successful. And that we would trust you when things don't look so successful. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Uh, Amen. Okay. My, uh, my assignment tonight is in 2 Samuel chapter 10. Now, <clears throat> ask me to pick up at verse 13 and I believe uh, Tom uh, talked about Sunday night. These um, battles that David is uh, involved in and um, the, the mercenaries uh, that have been hired and <clears throat> the fact that, that David is beginning to uh, rout um, the uh, adversary and kind of put uh, kind of Joab kind of puts them in the front, and then uh, Abba, uh, Abishai in, in the back, uh, see. And so he gets them, you know, both uh, kind of protecting his back flank and, um, and uh, advancing in his front. Now, chapter 10 and verse 12, really, really to me, is a is an inspiring um, verse. Yeah. I know I'm supposed to start at 13, but I really like 12. Um, I'm sorry. It is potential potential spam. You know, Marshall's right. Every time that uh, somebody's phone goes off. It is, it is always a boomer, isn't it? I, it's never the kids. I mean, the kids know how to shut these things off. But, you know, you get some old man up front, and uh, he's clueless. He can't, can't run the mic, can't run the phone. It's, uh, you guys laugh. It's not easy, and it's coming for you. So. <coughs> yeah, yeah. 2 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 12. <clears throat> Be of good courage and let us play the man on behalf of our people and the cities of our God. And Jehovah do what seems good to him. I like that. Be of good courage and let us play the man on behalf of our people and the cities of our God. And Jehovah do what seems good to him. <clears throat> Verse 13. So, Joab and all the people who were with him drew near to the battle against the Syrians. And they fled before him. And when the sons of Ammon saw that the Syrians, that the Syrians had fled, they likewise fled before Abishai and entered into the city. Then Joab returned from the sons of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. And when the Syrians saw that they were put to the worse before Israel, they gathered themselves together. And Hadassar sent and brought out the Syrians who were beyond the river. And they came to Helam with Shobach, the captain of the army, and Hadassar at their head. And it was told David, and he gathered all Israel together and passed over the Jordan 
and came to Helam. And the Syrians set themselves in array against David and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel. And David killed of the Syrians the men of 700 chariots and 40,000 horsemen and killed Shobach, the captain of their army, so that he died there. And when all the kings who were servants to Hadassar saw that they were put to the worst before Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians were afraid to help the sons of Ammon anymore. Now, certainly we've got the description of a battle here that David is very successful in this uh, encounter. <clears throat> and if you, if you kind of look at this, this uh, chapter as a, uh, as a whole, uh, you see that, that in the first five verses, now, we're not, not really told why. The assumption is that, <coughs> that the king of Ammon uh, somehow had done David a favor because following the death of his father, <coughs> David, <coughs> excuse me, David had sent messengers to comfort him. But his, um, his um, intelligence, his counterintelligence, says, man, he's not here to help you. He's here to spy you out and to take your stuff. So <clears throat> the messengers of goodwill that David sent are rejected and insulted. Right? cut off their clothes, and cut off half of the beards, and they, they send them in humiliation back home. So this is a challenge to David. What are you doing coming in here trying to spy out my stuff? And David then accepts the challenge for war. Uh, you kind of see that in 2 Samuel 10, uh, 6 through 8, and, and Tom covered that. Now, the Ammonites and their mercenaries are defeated by Joab. That's what we read tonight. Because they signed up, uh, not only was, was the, the king's men, but they signed up mercenaries to fight uh, for them. And in the front and in the back. Now, after the initial chasing them down, Hadassar rallies all of Mesopotamia to continue that war against David. But again, if we look at uh, chapter 10, verses 15 through 19, again, uh, Hadassar the king uh, suffers defeat. So David is, is at the height of some real successful uh, encounters against people who were coming against him. It's pretty evident then, if we kind of look at where we're talking about tonight, that, that God is with him in these uh, victories. Now, if you look at 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 19, we've got a similar account. Well, we've got the same account that is um, uh, given to us by the, uh, uh, by the chronicle, chronicler, um, in uh, First Chronicles, um, 
chapter 19. So if you want to turn over there, take a look at that. First Chronicles uh, chapter 19, where uh, There we go. All right. <clears throat> it happened after this that uh, Nahash, king of the sons of Ammon, died, and his son reigned instead of him. And David said, I'll show kindness to Haman, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness, his father showed kindness to me. Now, we're not sure what that was, but, but David, then at some point, he had done a, a, a good turn to David. So David is reaching out upon his death, see, to, to, to his son. So David sends messengers to, to comfort him concerning his father. David's servants come into the land, uh, the sons of Hammon, to... Um, Haman to comfort him. But the rulers of the sons of Ammon said to Haman, you think David honors your father and that he sent comforters to you? Have not his servants come to you to search and to overthrow and spy out the land? So Haman took David's servants, shaved them, cut their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. And they came and informed David about the men, and he sent to meet them. The men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, remain at Jericho until your beards be grown, then return. And the sons of Ammon saw that they had made themselves stink to David. Ammon and the sons of Ammon sent a thousand talents of silver to hire for them chariot and horsemen out of Mesopotamia and out of Syria. So they hired for them 32,000 chariots and the king of Mecca and his people who came and encamped before Meba and the sons of Ammon gathered themselves together for their cities and came to battle. That was something else that gave me <coughs> some, some thinking. Um, that, that's an interesting, uh, I think that's really an interesting turn of uh, phrase here when, um, when we're told that uh, not only they hired the uh, men to do this, but because of the actions in, in 1 Chronicles 19, 6, that they had made themselves a stink to David. I was wondering why it was kind of put that way. And then I got to thinking about, you know, when when God talks about the sacrifices, that the, the animals are sacrificed and the smell from the altar arrives as a soothing aroma to him. And in the tabernacle, at the burning of the incense, that too is a fragrance offered to God. Now, I was thinking about this term, they became a, a stink or odorous to uh, David. And, and they say that, <clears throat> you know, the olfactory uh, senses, even though sometimes we don't recognize those, are one of the key components to memory. We remember things because of our smell. So they become a 
stink to David as opposed to putting David into a rage. See? Now, I was, I was kind of thinking about that, that, you know, sometimes, some, sometimes we feel like maybe we fall short in, in being able to forgive people because they still stink. Never been around. <coughs> <You know. laughs> Ever been around somebody with uh, distinctive body odor? Well, what you do in those cases is you often adjust your personal space. We, just, we do it unconsciously. We don't say, oh, it stinks. But we don't necessarily have that you know, every time that that individual walks into the room, we see horns and a forked tail, and we think about the wrong that they've done. No, they still smell funny. <laughs> they still... Think. I think I think there's something being communicated there with that these guys became a stink to David. The, David was not enraged necessarily as to go get him, but it stunk, you know. And so it stinks so bad that, you know, David decides to, to kind of clean this, clean this up uh, a little bit, you know. And so David's going to exact um, some compensation because he's reached out to them and in um, wanting to help, and he's kind of, he's kind of, you know, brought back a, a, a bloody stub. Uh, so as this um, progresses, as this, this smell continues, see, verse 8, First Chronicles 19, David hears of it, he sends Joab and all the army of the mighty men and the sons of Ammon come out and put the battle in array at the gate of the city. And the kings that came were by themselves in the field. Now when Joab sees that the battle set against them in the front and from behind, he chooses all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the company he commits into the hand of Abishai, his brother, and they put themselves in the array against the son of Ammon. And one said, look, if I need help, you come help me. If you need help, I'll come help you. See, two are better than one in case one falls in a ditch. And a cord of three strands is not easily broken. So, verse 14, Joab comes near the Syrians to do battle, and they fleed before him. And when the sons of Ammon saw that the Syrians had fled, they likewise fled before Abishai, his brother, and entered into the city. And Joab came to Jerusalem. And when the Syrians saw that they were put to the worst before Israel, they sent messengers and drew forth the Syrians that were beyond the river with Hadassar at their head. And it was told to David that, look, you know, they're, uh, they're pretty much on their way. You know, 
Um, no, no worries. Verse 17 is told to David, and he gathers all of Israel together, passes over the Jordan, comes upon the, uh, the uh, Syrians, and arranges a battle against them. Now, they're, they're pretty much done, but what are they going to do now? See, the Syrians fleed before Israel, and David kills uh, men of the Syrians, men of 7,000 chariots, 40,000 on foot, and uh, kills the captain of the army. And when the servants of Hadassar saw that they were put to the worst before Israel, they made peace with David. David had, David had held out an olive branch in the beginning. So they went through all of this, and then they're defeated by uh, David, and they serve David. See, uh, neither would the Syrians help the sons of Ammon uh, anymore. So, so the Syrians can't be, uh, can't be uh, mercenaries anymore. My point is that David is seeing success after success after success. Back to 2 Samuel chapter 10. 2 Samuel chapter 10. And so you, you see the, the, the way that this thing plays out. Oh, yeah. And verse 1 of 2 Samuel 11. A little, a little note here. A little meanwhile back at the ranch. Oh, yeah, there was something about this cleanup procedure. It happened at the return of the year at the time when kings go out to battle, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel. And they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Raboth. But David remained at Jerusalem. <clears throat> Things are going so well that I don't have to do the things I used to do. And by not doing the things that he used to do, he spies this gal taking a bath. Now, if it were not for his tremendous success, he would have not had the audacity to stay back in Jerusalem. He would have been with his troops fighting. Sometimes God realizes that we are much better at handling adversity than we are success. Ever notice that most of your spiritual growth has happened during times of adversity. Very little spiritual growth tends to happen during times of great success because we relax. And we don't give credit where credit is due. We start to get perhaps a little lax. I think there's a lesson here, not that we shouldn't pray for, desire, and participate in success, but whether it's, whether it's the uh, virus panic or whether things seem to be going swimmingly, 
He's got the whole world in his hand. And this is not by my planning, by my hook, by my crook. The real question is, am I going to trust him as much in success as I do adversity? I tend to pray more during times of adversity than I do times of success. It's probably pretty dangerous. Not that I should always look at the success and think, oh, next shoe's going to drop. There's going to be something bad happening, you know? There's going to be something bad happening if I don't consider where this is coming from and why God has um, allowed these successes in, in our lives to, to, to take place. Uh, that's not to say that we should be looking for adversity. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. No need to go looking for it. It'll find you. Tomorrow's got enough, enough troubles of its own. But when things are going well, when you, when you get to your destination, as you pray, when you take a, maybe a long car trip to Bible Bowl, when you set out, I think it's just as important to pray when you get there. I have a tendency to be really happy when we get there. But there might be just a little bit of an idea that I'm a pretty good driver. <laughs> you know, I got us there because, yeah, thanks God, I got it from here. No, you don't. No, you don't. And, and the minute you think, I got it from here, then we've started to assess good and evil in our own minds and not trust God to determine good and evil. What Satan has not been able to stamp out through adversity, he is now attempting to stamp out through decadence. Adversity steals the people of God and they react to adversity. But success can have a tendency to have us let down our guard. And when we do, we end up in places that we shouldn't be, facing temptations that we shouldn't be facing. Some scholars have said that 2 Samuel chapter 10 is an account of David's successes and that 2 Samuel chapter 11 and forward is the record of his, uh, of, of his uh, defeats. <clears throat> I don't know if that's even a literary mechanism that's being used here, but I think when we see what led to David perhaps being relaxed. We, we need to appreciate how much success in, in our society, in Western civilization, that, that God has given us. We, we need to appreciate that. <clears throat> but we need to keep in mind 
that we have that success for a purpose. And that purpose is not our comfort. Our purpose is to seek and save the lost while the green tree remaineth. Otherwise, our personal testimonies can be devastated. Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful and thankful for the principles that we can look at, that we can see. Father, we are a, a blessed people. In the course of human history, existence as human existence has, has, has meant suffering. And yet, Father, we are so fortunate to live in a time when we don't, we don't, really, we don't really know what suffering is. I'm grateful for that. But help us to see it as an opportunity to press forward. And not a time to relax on our laurels or to just uh, take uh, what benefits us. But Father, to remember that the foundation of Jesus being the anointed one, being the Christ, the Son of the living God, being, Father, in, in charge of all, having the whole world in his hand, and his people selected to carry out his purpose. Help us to remember your purpose and not to get that confused with our comfort. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thanks for your attention.